It says it's streaming live on YouTube. Yeah, I'm hooking it up now. It says it is now streaming live on live on YouTube. Yeah, good. Yep. Yep, there we are. Good. Great. How's things at City Hall? Were you there today or no? Oh, I popped in just for a minute. Nothing from the Corps of Engineers, right? Yeah, they acknowledged that I forwarded it, it on to you. Um, I think the acknowledgement said they have 20 days okay. to respond. But so at least they acknowledged it. Hopefully he'll start before then. Hello, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Hello there. How are we doing? Good. Good, good, good. It's getting on. It's getting on. How's everybody doing? Doing all right? Live and well. Live and well. Upright and taking nourishment. In your easy chair. Yep. Good way to be. Either that or out on the patio, one or the two. So <laughs> Yeah, I thought about that. It got chilly last evening. I thought it might do it again, so I better yeah. not do it. Yeah. No, it's it, even the last couple of nights have been pretty little on the crisp side. Yeah. And there's Charlotte. Hey, Charlotte. Oh. Yes. Do you like? Can you hear me, Jack? Oh yeah, yeah. Do you like it better on your real computer? Yeah, I think I do. It's it's just a little bit better picture, I think. Oh well, I don't know if that's a good thing. It should be a better. No, I mean the uh, all the squares are going to be a little bigger. I hope. That's what I said. I don't know if that's such a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, looks good. Everybody looks healthy and well. There's Mr. Kernan. Yeah. Howdy. How are you, Joseph? He is muted. I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Thank you. 
<laughs> like your hat, Jack. Yeah, nice, huh? Yes, it is. I think I've uh, got better looking. <laughs> Don't you I'm think? Cute. Yeah, definitely. Huh? I've like got cuter. better looking. Really cute. <laughs> A pug. That's my last one to die. Aww. Bullet. Had so many pugs, I almost forgot their names. Did you open your open the thing up so it takes up the whole screen, Jack? I just did. Okay, that makes it easier too, better. Yeah. We're live on YouTube now. Yes. While we're sitting here waiting. Mm-hmm. Six more minutes. I have no. At least, at least we know it's working. For the moment, don't curse it. Hey, did anybody hear about the bear? You you had to, didn't you, Mayor? That was two years ago. Well, I I got a call yesterday that they were talking about it was up on there was one up on Hametown Road. That's a picture from two years ago. Oh, it, it wasn't recently? Not that I know of, no. Okay, because that's what I, so I told, told my sister as well. I, says, I haven't heard anything. It's not like anybody's going to contact me. What am I going to do about it? Run out and chase it down? But I said, we did a couple <laughs> Is that years the bear? Back. Yeah. Bear? No, that was a couple years ago. That was like when Chris Bessie went out and took in photographs. So, so they just and then somebody also had on there that after the picture was taken that they thought it was hit by a car. Yeah. Yeah, but then that was a couple that was a couple years ago. That didn't happen just recently. Okay. No. no. That's that's what I told her. I haven't heard anything, and I couldn't find nothing. And I don't know, but you know they do come around. Yeah. <laughs> There's a Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Hi, Dennis. He might, he's muted too. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. Everybody's supposed to be here.
Mr. Courant is present, counted for. There he is. Dennis, hey Dennis, can you hear yes. me? You can hear me, okay. Yeah. I, Thursday night, I had a problem with my my audio on the board of health meeting, so I just want to make sure I could be heard. You're That's, good. Okay, thanks. Loud and clear. Okay, thanks. Hey, Paul. Hello. Can you, can you hear us? Okay. I can hear you, Carrie. Hey, Paul. How are you? Good evening. Hello, Paul. Hi, Dennis. Howdy. <clears throat> Hi, Jack. Hey, Joe. Hello. If you get a chance after the meeting, could you give me a call? This is about a private request. It has nothing to do with council. Okay. Just call me back after the meeting, please. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. You can all look at uh, Paul's flag when we say the pledge. Have you done <laughs> that before? I don't know real neat that he put that up there. Or did you have that up there before, Paul? I put it up just so I had a, a flag to look at while I was saying the pledge, to be honest. Right, yeah, I was kind of wondering about that before we started. I had a little wavy when I brought out the second time around. Then you had that up. <laughs> Feels odd enough doing this. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, um, Scott is not, is excused tonight, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I call this Norton City Council Committee work session to order for Monday, June 15th. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silent reflection. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which stands one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated, please. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Mr. Gaynor? Here. Ms. McLeod? Here. Mr. Caron? Here. Mr. Talisley? Here. Ms. Whipke? Here. Mr. Pilot? Mr. Pilot's excused. Mr. Kernan? Here. Do we have any, did we get any communications in from the public? We did not. Okay, no communications from the public. We'll move the committee of the whole. Um, caliber CRA, letter A, Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just about a parcel of uh, land at 4609030, parcel number at 3985 Eastern Road, corner of Hametown and Worcester. It's across the street from the Stone Jail. Um, it's owned by Timothy Enterprises and uh, asking for or for giving them a, a tax exemption <clears throat> under the CRA Community Reinvestment Area. And uh, it's a 12,000 square foot building going up for now. Uh, be operated by caliber collision, 10 years uh, tax exemption at 50%. Uh, the city, the way I understand it, has provided notice to the schools and the company, company is moving from Copley. So a notice has also been given to Summit County, the way I understand it. Looks like a total investment of uh, 1.825 million there's supposed to be five new jobs provided by December of 2022, and that would provide a payroll of $206,000 a year. Also, there are seven present employees moving here, and they presently have a payroll of $285,000, which combined it should be around $490,000 to $500,000 by the December 2022 date. Uh, I personally want to thank Mr. Fowler, the mayor, and, and all the staff at City Hall that's worked on this, and they've done an excellent job in bringing these businesses to the city, and I want to give my personal thanks to them in behalf of the citizens of Norton, and I'd like to move to add this to the next agenda, if I could, please. Second that. There's a motion and a second to add um, this legislation to the next agenda for first reading. Is there any discussion, anything to add, Mr. Fowler, or? No, I mean, uh, there's one clarification. This is actually moving from Doylestown or Chippewa Township. This one's moving from Chippewa and the other one's moving from Copley, but uh, the, the semantics is okay. But, you know, it's, it's you know, thank you, Mr. Gaynor, but us council allowing us to put that water line in on Eastern Road, that's what precipitated this development. They knew we were putting a water line in, they needed water and sewer. And uh, there's gonna be more to come in this section. Any further comments or? Yeah, um, just a quick question. Now, it's, it has little bearing, but I just wanted to know. Um, do you know how long the this business has been in business? How they've been, how long they've been at their current location? It's it's the original Naggies, so I imagine it's been in business quite some time. Okay, I, I can find the original date. They were purchased at the end of last year by Caliber Collision. So, but they're moving from Chippewa over to North. I'll, so I'll get you. They've been around a while then. Yeah, yeah. If it's Nagy, if it's Nagy, it's been around. I've heard that yeah. name before. Nagy Body Shop, absolutely. And like I said, we're excited about them coming to town. And uh, like I said, we certainly want to welcome them and uh, hope that uh, they do well uh, moving to their to our city. So, um, is this um, just for first reading? 
Uh, they would like to get started as quickly as possible, and this would need to pass before construction would start. Okay. So All if right. we could pass it on the first read, I would hope that they could get started. Any the further any further comments or discussion? There's a motion and a second to add this uh, uh, ordinance number 59-2020 to the next agenda for first reading, waiving second and third. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Mr. Gaynor? Yes. Mr. Karen? Yes. Mr. McLennan? Yes. Letter B, Ag Pro CRA. Uh, Mr. Gaynor? <clears throat> this is another uh, under the CRA uh, agreements. It's at 3060 Barber Road. It's also, well, I understood them both come from Copley, but I have it here as moving from Copley, this one. And uh, same situation, 50% exemption for 10 years. Uh, looks like a total investment around $2 million. Uh, they have 15 existing full-time employees uh, with a $535,000 payroll approximately. They plan to add uh, two or eight new jobs uh, with a payroll of an additional 400,000 by December 31st of 2021, um, which gives you a combined total of almost a million dollar payroll, 935,000 or so by December 31st of 2021. Now I understand that all required notices have been done to the county and the school since it's moving from Copley. Um, again, thank the mayor and Mr. Fowler and all the staff and also for AgPro for considering Norton over all other places that are available. And I also moved to add, uh, what is it, uh, 60 2020 to the next agenda, please. I'll second that. There's a motion and a second to add uh, ordinance number 60 2020 to the next agenda for first reading. Is there any further discussion or questions? Yes, Mr. President. I'd just like to add that uh, they're also selling us like 14 acres that uh, for a dollar that we're, we're looking at uh, possibly using as a retention pond area. Would that be correct, Mr. Fowler? Yes, in, in lieu of the, and, and again, this is on new construction. So the current bill will not be abated. It's only on the expansion that they're going to break ground on in July. So, so we need to waive readings on this one. Yes, well. please. Yes. And then one other question. Um, <clears throat> these, would these be subject to TIFs? Possibly. Possibly, okay. Mr. Mr. Markey and I are having that discussion. We okay. are, we are, we are evaluating that. Okay. Very possible. Any further discussion regarding Ordinance 60-2020? There's a motion and a second to add Ordinance 60-2020 to the next agenda for first reading, waiving second and third. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Mr. Gaynor? Yes. Mr. Kara? Yes. Mr. McLaren? Yes. Moving on to letter C. Me, me, yes. Can you hear me? <laughs> Oh, well, I get to do the three. Never mind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to letter C, the fire levy. Uh, that's resolution number 61, Mr. Towsley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, back on May 11th, this council voted to move forward with a resolution of necessity to uh, seek to the voters uh, a new fire levy in, in November. So really, this is just the next step in that process. And... Uh, Hello. So we got to move forward. Anybody have anything else to offer? I think I talked to Mr. Powell. It's going to bring in about three hundred thousand dollars, if I understand it right. Yeah, that's. I think that's over and above what it was in the past. So, and so it would be an extra three hundred thousand dollars. Is that the understanding? That, that's my understanding. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? All okay, right. so then with that, I will make a motion to move uh, resolution 61 2020 to council's next agenda. I'll second. Um, it has to be me or Dennis. Yeah, right. So I'll second. 
Will the clerk call the roll, please? Mr. Tasley? Yes. Mr. Curran? Yes. Mr. McLellan? Yes. Uh, letter D, CARES Act Funding, Resolution Number 62-2020, Ms. Whipke. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> this is actually for us to be able to collect for expenditures that we haven't accounted for already at the end of March um, when we did our budget. And this, is, this would be expenditures for the COVID emergency. And it was going to be looking at uh, reimbursement from like March 1st to December 30th. We also need to get this done. It is required if we don't get it past ASAP, we won't be eligible for any of the reimbursements of the of costs involving the COVID epidemic. So this does have ER language. We also need to waive the second and third readings on this so we can get it done as soon as possible. And if nobody else has anything to add, I'm going to motion to add resolution 62 2019 to Council's next agenda. Again, has emergency language, and we're looking to waive the second and third readings. And I'll second that. And just as a matter of correction, it's uh, 62 2020. Oh, what did I call it? 2019. Oh, <laughs> well, must have been a better year. That's all right. <laughs> it was Is definitely there any a better else? summer. <laughs> yeah. Any further discussion or questions? Would the clerk call the roll, please? Ms. Repke? Yes. Mr. Kernan? Yes. Moving on to letter E, noise ordinance, ordinance number 63-2020, Mr. Towsley. Thank you, Mr. President. This is an item the administration has been working on for quite some time to try to get a noise ordinance into place. Um, I have just a couple comments on the noise ordinance myself. Um, they're not game changers for me, but um, point number five calls for nighttime being hours of 10, 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. and weekends 11 p.m. to 8 a.m. My personal preference would leave Saturday at 7 a.m. as well. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that. Um, and then at the end of the uh example we have in front of us it talks about exemptions and i don't know how how specific we need to be i don't know how if i'm being overly critical in this i just want to make sure we're doing this right so um i just wonder if in the exemptions we should have lawn mowers snow blowers chainsaws and the like mentioned in there because each of those items run at a higher decibel than what's suggested within the documentation. And then finally, the, 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 I guess the only question I have, uh, maybe for Mr. Markey, is on the enforcement, would this pretty much just be a police judgment call? It, it's a police judgment call. Can you hear me okay? For yes. Sure. Okay, yeah, it's a police judgment call. There are standards within that uh, ordinance that they have to rely on. We did discuss this ordinance with the chief and uh, he was he was appreciative of the increase in standards that would allow them to do their job and exercise the discretion that you're talking about as well. Uh, and then they did review with the prosecutor. So this is, this is an ordinance that's modeled off of the Summit County ordinance, a noise ordinance. So we know it's been implemented before and it's been uh, used. So uh, that that's where it's at. Um, but yes, there is some discretion within there, Paul. Okay. Yeah. So, what about my suggestion of with the lawnmowers, chainsaws and the like? Is that necessary? Or am I overthinking? Can I have uh, uh, here? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, my, just a thought. And I think I don't know of a whole lot of chainsaws and lawnmowers that are urgent that need to be done at really early hours, but a snowblower could be an emergency for someone getting out to work or even emergency uh, people yeah. getting to the fire department or the police. So that I would suggest if we're gonna mention them, snowblowers, you'd hate to run them early in the morning, but they sometimes are an emergency, you have to get out. That's a safety issue. The rest of it, you know, I well, the, the yeah. only reason I bring that up is because it says for daytime hours, 65 decibels is the limit. And I looked 
like a lawnmower runs at 90 according to google so that's well, that's the only reason i bring that up yeah if go ahead mr markey i was going to ask no something. go ahead go ahead I'm, I'm looking at it again um uh, my question was uh, do does the city own decibel meters where they're going to be checking these in case of uh of uh, complaints and where would the person with the decibel meter be standing at the nearest house or on the highway, uh, Barber Road, or uh, to check, you know, in case this, uh, um, in case the speedway is a little loud and somebody's complaining and the policeman, is the policeman gonna go out there with a decimal meter and where is he going to go with the decimal meter? Because the farther away it is, of course, the lower the decibels. So how, how are we going to determine, um, you know, where, how, how are you going to determine where those decibels are made at? Or, you know, it, it, it says right in here at the point of complaint. So, so then the, the person making the complaint, that decibel meter would have to go, say, to the, the house that the person made the complaint from and stand on their uh, porch or okay. something. That's what it says, yeah. Is that right? I didn't read it, truthfully. I have not read it. Uh, but I was wondering uh, if if that person making the complaint, um, you know, if you would have to go to their exact residence and then state in the ticket if it was necessary for a ticket to be issued. Uh, I was on Mr. Jones's front porch and checked the decimal meter because he made the complaint. Would that be a scenario, Mr. Markey, that... Uh, might possibly arise. Uh, I'd have to talk to the police chief to see how they would handle that. I, I don't know offhand. Because truthfully, uh, uh, if a decibel meter, if we're going to use decibel meters above 65 um, decibels, um, I could stand on my back porch and hear the traffic go by on 261 and about one out of 10 cars would exceed that decibel meter. Uh, I, I'm not going to stand and complain about it, nor do I want somebody to come on my porch and take the decibel meter reading because the car's <laughs> already gone. So, I, and also in the case of the racetrack, if there is a race car that's a little louder than the other race car, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that... Uh, 65 decibels is, is uh, I think, exceedingly low for uh, an ordinance. I, I Myself, I, I think it should be quite higher, but I'm not an expert on it, so I don't know. So again, I think, you know, uh, my thought is, is that this would, number one, be complaint driven. So mm -hmm. nobody's going to go out with a decibel meter and stand on somebody's porch unless they called up and complained. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, is that the police always do have that. They, the officers have that ability, um, you know, to um, to not necessarily ticket, to warn, to um, use their discretion. Um, I mean, that that's part of what police officers do. Um, so, you know, I, I think probably my guess is, is that if this is modeled after Summit County, it's probably been tested and it's probably constitutional because I know with noise ordinances for a while, there were some questions regarding them. Um, so I would assume that this has been tested and that it's enforceable. I wouldn't doubt it a bit that it's enforceable. My only question was, does the city own decibel meters and are they frequently used? And on what occasions are they used? Only by complaint? Or how are they used? I've never heard of yeah, us. Well, one thing well, after, the, go, yeah, we'll, go have to, we'll have to find out because without a decibel meter reading, you can't show the violation. So um, it's a judgment call, though, with the police officer is in let number three. Uh, it indicates that a decibel meter is not necessary. It's a judgment call. Yeah. Back page. Oh, so, so, I'm so saying to say it sounded right, like it's a decibel uh, of six. Yeah, it's not required, right? I, I I agree, but I'll find out if we have them or intend to use them. I would assume on a bar speed, but they're going to go more by time than the decibel. 
when they quit. I would too. I would yeah. too. I agree. I just wanted to add, I, w I wouldn't have any problem with changing it to 7 a.m. on the weekends either, Paul. There are people, they want to get their stuff done. They want to be able to mow their grass or whatever so that they've got plans and get it done before they leave so they don't have to worry about rushing back to get it done. So I really don't see an issue with changing that from 8 to 7. As it might be a good idea, though, to put the mowers and chainsaws down for added in there explicitly because I've heard them more than often than not and we're giving them an extra hour on the weekend if we change it to seven anyway. Are we talking about exemptions or just adding them in writing to the to the ordinance because I think Paul was talking about exemptions weren't you Paul? Well, I was I, I mean it really doesn't matter where is the, my only thing is Sometimes in situations, people tend to weaponize ordinances and what, you know, when they have disputes with neighbors and it, if it's in there, then it kind of takes that uh, weapon from the, such a situation. So mm. anywhere in there is fine with me. <clears throat> you mean as an exemption, Paul? That, that's what I originally was talking that's about. That's what I thought you meant too, right? Yes. I, and like I said, I didn't know if I was being too specific or um, how much that mattered. It was just a thought I had. I mean, I'm good with it either way. I, it, you, you could add it in; it wouldn't bother me. I, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, not to be silly about it, but what happens if you have a no neighbor who's riding a chainsaw just to annoy the other neighbor? Right. I mean, there, there's always discretion in weird circumstances. But I, you know, so I'm, I'm fine. Time. I'm fine with whatever, however you guys decide, obviously. Um, I, the way I read the, uh, just one other thing that came to mind was uh, the way I read the article in the paper uh, about the sale of the uh, Barbican Speedway and such. They uh oh. I think I just lost you. No, you're there. Okay. I hear you. Okay. Uh, I believe like the mayor is waiting. I, I believe I read. Do you still hear me? Yeah. We just can't see you. Okay. Uh, I I believe I read where uh, 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 where they were planning on having concerts, and I I I, uh, I hesitate to. Uh, <laughs> to uh, put such a pressure on the, the, the new owners or the old of the Speedway that they would not be able to even have a race if a person was complaining. Uh, I mean, those racetracks are normally loud, as everybody knows, and, and surely it's going to be over 65 decibels. It's, it's past 11 o'clock exemption. It's a newly organized sporting event, so it's exempted until 11 o'clock. Okay, so then at 11 o'clock, are, are they going to be shut down the race? They're going to have to stop running at 11 o'clock. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. And the concerts would be the same. I would imagine, yes. Or any well, other, I not necessarily them, Joe, but just anybody. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 correct, yeah. I mean, it'd be like, I mean, football games don't go that that late, but I mean, it'd be the same type of thing. Well, well, what about when they have their specials? Like, I mean, they have people come in from many states to come in for the special events that are so many laps. Yeah, they'll have to stop at 11 o'clock. So or start so earlier. Or start earlier. Well, maybe start earlier, but I just have an issue with telling a bunch of people that came in from out of state to participate in a race and there's numerous ones and they're all bringing income and they don't have that many specials. It's not like they're a special every Saturday night or whatever, but if they do have um, a year in special championships or whatever, I think that they should be allowed to go beyond that as long as they put in for a permit or something stating that this is a, a one-time event because I would expect them to shut down a race because they've had an accident or if there's a problem 
with the um, the track that they need to get cleaned up in order to make it safe. So they're going to are they going to be compelled to not do these things to keep the the people racing safe? And like I said, it's not like they have those. What do they have? Maybe twice a year that they have those real specials that really draws in the extra people. And so I don't see how, how they can be said that they 11 o'clock, you have to quit, even though you quit for the safety of spectators and, and the participants in the race, 11 o'clock, you're quitting and you don't get to finish this race. That is a special thing that's drawn in all these extra people. Is it possible to build in an exemption that could be applied for 30 days in advance? So notice it could be put out to the city. To residents so that they would know in advance this is a special exemption could yeah, that be built? It, yeah at least move it back to to midnight maybe i mean i i haven't been there for many many years but i i was there quite often in my younger days and and as a child and they do they shut down so they you stop know everything this thing i mean this ordinance isn't just about the speedway <laughs> No, it's but about, it's about no, everything. No, it will. It, it'll be used that way as well. And that is that's a thing that we hear about every year, the complaints coming out of it. I just don't want to have to restrict them on those two races they have a year when they draw in a lot extra than what they would have otherwise. And some of those people come from pretty far away. If we build in a discretionary exemption, uh, it, it's not that it has to be given, but it could be given. It's just they have to let us know maybe a month in advance if it's planned. Then we could let the residents in the area at least know what's going on. And it would be up to the discretion of council or the mayor or a city administrator uh, whether or not to grant that. I think it's situational and not, again, not just for the raceway, but any type of special thing like that, that it goes late. If it's planned, then maybe that would work if we just write that in. I agree with that because there, there are going to be uh, events at our Columbia Woods Park that might possibly go longer than that. And, and uh, so I, I would think if you give the public a notice, uh, 15, 30 days, whatever, like uh, Dan says, it would be a good idea to add something for that in there, I, I wouldn't have any problem with that at all. And that would that would also give the uh, anybody planning on an event, whether it's a speedway or us at the Columbia Woods Park or plazas having a special event or we're having fireworks, anything. Um, I, I would think that that would be a good idea to put something in there to give notice of special events that might possibly override over overrun, you know. Uh, it's beyond me why it is that whoever's planning the event can't plan it so it's done by 11 o'clock. I agree. I don't have a problem with that at all either. But yeah, I just explained to you why they may not have any control over it because they well, you better shut, you better build some extra time in for it. They do shut the track down anytime there's an accident or if there's something wrong with it in order to clean it up to make it safe. And they don't they can't say oh we're planning on this many accidents or something just happens. And, and for, Mr. for Mr. Gaynor's knowledge, uh, fireworks festivals and, and the like are, are provided for uh, okay, good. within the exemption area. Good. Thank you, Bob. Sure. So we, we've had quite a few things said. I think we got to clean up just a little bit. Um, does anybody agree with Ms. Whitney or want to move with her as, as far as extending the hours under certain circumstances? I'm personally okay with it the way it is. Yeah, I am too. I am I too. Mean, I'm flexible on that. Yeah, I, I was looking for a way to make it work if that was that important. But if it's not, my wife likes her sleep as much as everybody, so... <laughs> I, I think uh, really, uh, as far as Charlotte's talking there, that doesn't happen too often. And and I really don't have a problem with extending the hour to midnight or to asking the racetrack if that happens to be the case or someone else, as far as that goes, to start their event in enough time to allow for accidents and things like that. 
I don't know what time they start those events. I've never been to one in my life. I just hate to make it a problem for any business in Norton, especially the racetrack that's been there so long. I hate to make it a problem for them and have, uh, you know, have discussions over it for no reason. If we can ask them if they can't start their, their uh, events a little bit early to make sure they're done by 11 o'clock. I, I, I think, like Joe said, I believe that they could start them early enough to where they would be finished in time. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's going to be very often that they have more than an hour leeway. I mean, one way or another. So if they start them an hour earlier on these special events, they should be able to take care of it. Another concern I would have with, with granting an exemption on the time is how much over you know, an hour, two hours, three, then, then you're getting into a little bit of a mess there as far as when is too much. If, if you just have it a solid time, that is too much. You know, and, and once again, there's, there, there's police discretion. So if they hadn't taken the speedway, for example, if they had an inordinate number of accidents and it was only going to take them another half an hour or an hour to finish up, they tell the police that and the police say, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to cite you. I mean, you know, you got to use common sense. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I'm, good, I'm good with it. If you want to change the seven, change it to 7 a.m. on the weekends, I'm fine with that too. I'm, I'm always up at five o'clock anyway. So <laughs> does, you know. does anybody have an issue with that particular? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can can we change that at least from uh, eight to seven on Saturdays? And then I, w I was just thinking, um, I had mentioned the, the basically the lawn equipment. Would it be damaging or helpful to just get rid of the, the decibel amounts within the, the legislation? So that's just a judgment call. I mean, that's a question I think for Justin, I think that sometimes is, where you do run into enforcement problems. Okay. It, it, I would believe. I think you have to have some sort of standard and say, here it is, whether you can measure it accurately or not, actually it's somewhat immaterial, but with no standard, then it is anybody's judgment call, whether that's too loud or not. I think something. Right. I, can. Yeah, I think we wanted to, I, I mean, at least I think Mr. Fowler and myself, our intention was to have an ordinance that Dalton in decibels and Mr. Fowler, you can weigh in as well, just to take, there is discretion, but uh, someone wants to argue that noise isn't really that loud. That's a good objective way to show them that it is pretty loud actually. So. Okay. Okay. But so if we want to put in, a, if we want to put in like a personal power equipment, you know, like lawn care, you know, equipment, some type of exemption for that. I mean, it, I don't think it hurts it. I would be in favor of that, but it, it's not like a game changer for me either. So does anybody else have an opinion on that? No. I think seven o'clock in the morning is plenty early enough to be mowing grass. Yeah, I think it's fine. Okay. Any other discussion? I would have just to say, let's just use this as a trial. We can always come back and revisit it next year. True. True. Okay. So with that, I will make a motion to add Ordinance 63 2020 to council's next agenda. Second. Um, that has to be either me or Dennis, so I'll second it. Okay. Re really quick, does that have does that have emergency language? I I didn't see. It does have emergency language. Okay, so just so that's in there with emergency language. Yeah. I think we want to let it go for its full readings though, because okay. we will comment if there is comment. All right, is there any further discussion? All right, we'll have a motion and a second to add ordinance 63-2020 to the next agenda for first reading. Will the clerk call the roll, please? Mr. Townsley? Yes. Mr. Kernan? Yes. Mr. McLean? Yes. Letter F, Wolf Creek Conservancy District, Mr. Gaynor. No, if it's all right, I'd prefer to do that at the last last item if you don't mind Come back to it yeah okay 
Uh, we'll come back to that. Level G established fund 500 um, would be ordinance number 65, 2020, Ms. Whitkey. Okay, um, this is where we're actually creating um, fund 500, which is going to contain all the capital project projects that we're going to have under one account. So they'll be under one heading and it would eliminate the need for creating a fund account every time we have an individual project, which I think is a great idea, as well as having them all under one heading. And then that way they'll be much easier to find for anyone and everyone. And it won't, uh, won't actually go into effect until next year. And each individual, I think I've kind of braced this before when we discussed it, each individual project will actually have separate lines like the road project we've made, I think the last time that's, but I think this will be a much easier way to keep track of everything. And uh, this is also creating a care act fund, which is where we're going to, um, okay, never I have to scroll up here which is what we discussed earlier before in order to take in reimburse monies that it's cost us for the COVID outbreak. Um, since that has a time limit on it, we need to get that passed. We need to waive the second and third reading so we can get this done, even though the actual the capital fund isn't going to be used right away. We need to have that line in there created. I think it will help with the documentation and applying for it getting those refunds, which we don't do this, we don't get any money. So if nobody has any other things to add to it, I'd make a motion to add ordinance 65 2020 to council's next agenda, look into way the second and third readings. This also contains emergency language. And I will second that motion. Is there any further discussion regarding ordinance uh, 65 2020? Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Mr. Towsley. Uh, Mr. Fowler wanted to make sure that I, I sent him a message. Uh, we have to create two CARES Act funds. So we need to change this to two. Uh, hold on. I, I, there was an, an email sent this after this morning um, or Friday based on a conversation we had with the county. So we're going to get two pots of money, one from the county and one from the state. Can I send that legislation, the revised legislation to Terry already? Yeah, that, that, that came through. Okay, just want to make sure that we understand so that. The will have two funds, one for the state, one for the county. Okay. Yeah. okay. Because we have to count for them separately because the county money, our obligations to the county, and the state money, if we misspend it, would be to return it to the state. We need to, for accounting purposes, keep them differentiated. I just want to make sure that was, that was clear. So we need this added to that, this particular legislation, two funds? Yeah, there is a there will be a substitute ordinance that was sent to carry Friday late because they had a conference call Friday telling them what we needed to do. Yeah, it, it definitely came through because I saw the ordinances today when I looked through everything. So it it definitely came through. Okay. So it's still ordinance 65. It just establishes two CARES Act funds right. and and the other. So. Um, Paul, did you have something that you wanted to ask, or were you just trying to let me know that Mr. Fowler had something to Yeah, that's it. I just saw him waving and wanted to let you know. Thank you. Anything further? All right. The motion second to add ordinance uh, 65 2020. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Ms. Whipkin? Yes. Mr. Curtin? Yes. Letter H, Regional Income Tax Authority contract. Ms. Whipkey? Um. This will make some people happy. This is act, this ordinance is actually looking to change our um, income tax collection agency from CCA over to RITA, the Regional Income Tax Authority. We have to give CCA six months notice in order to end the contract. So RITA won't be an actual service until next year as far as anyone's concerned for this year's taxes. And it's going to save us money. I believe it's like ninety thousand. Is that a year, Miss Keener? The ninety thousand we'll be saving. You're muted. That was an estimate based on their average. They're trying to tighten down our numbers now and give us their estimate for our actual rate. 
Okay. But it will be a savings. What, what, but was that for ye per year? Yes. Okay. And um, this is also going to offer more transparency. And um, it's noted they didn't actually shut down as good as CCA did during the COVID. So the, we may not have been having some of the issues with the residents needing to get some tax help. And, and it's going to make it more convenient for the residents, or at least we feel it will, because it's more, it's internet friendly. So it'll be more accessible than our current service. This also contains emergency language for everyone's information. So with that, I motion to add ordinance 66 2020 to council's next agenda. I'll second that. Um, if we have to give them six months notice, do we have to then pass it by the end of June so it can be in place by July 1st? Yes. Okay. All right. So, we so we'll be looking. Wave readings. Wave readings. Okay. Right. okay. Mr. Kernan. Yes, Mr. Tosley, go ahead. I just want to make sure we're getting the same services, just a different agency. In, in other words, the residents will still get the help that they've been getting through CPA. Yes. They do, okay. the, they do the, pre the taxpayer assistance as well. Ms. Keenan, are you pretty familiar with this, this group, the COG? Um, I, I'm not real familiar with it. I've always just dealt with CCA as a business and an individual, and their forms are impossible. We need an accountant to do ours. Um, that's why they have help down at sit, um, the community center for people to come in, residents to come in and figure out their taxes. Do you know, are you familiar with them? Do they have any easier forms? I heard it, it can be done online, but... Um, are you pretty familiar with them? Yeah, both Robert uh, or Mr. Fowler and myself are, are familiar with Rita, as is Justin. Um, I think you would find it's used mo mostly in Northeast Ohio, more so than CCA these days. Um, it appears that they have user-friendly forms available and the assistance. What, what is the Council of Governments? What, it, what cities or municipalities are part of that? Is that just a title? I'm, I'm not sure that. In other words, who, who else who else uses them? Mr. Just Robert. Yeah, Robert got his hand up. Yeah. So yeah. Robert can switch to Rita. Uh, yeah. They voted to switch to Rita about uh, last month. Um, so our concern administratively is you have a resident that has a Barberton puts Barberton on their taxes and files it a four four two zero three. If we don't go to Rita, we have a con we we Rita may send because Rita. One benefit of the Council of Governments, which is a bunch of conglomeration, Middleburg Heights, a lot of, I think there's 175 municipalities. The benefit of ha having that is they get to see your 1040. They pulled down your 1040 based on zip code. So Pam and I discussed my biggest concern is half of our, half of 44203 is in Norton. So our residents could get a letter from Rita saying, you need to file with us. Okay. Well, we're not beholden to Barberton, it is yeah. better for us to be in the same tax conglomerate as them. They offer EFT for, for payments. You no longer have to write a check as a business owner to the income tax agency, which is important for us to be more business friendly. They use the Ohio Business Gateway. There are a lot of things that they use that are way more business friendly than CCA. Um, and, you know, one of the questions that came up, they don't require you to submit W-2s because they have 80,000 employers that subscribe to their service and they get your W-2s in advance. So a lot of things that they do are more friendly. And to Mr. Someone asked the question about assistance. They have a toll-free number that someone's always there to help you. And they're located in Brexville, Excellent. which isn't that far. Uh, should you need to go up there, they'll be glad to help you there but we are going to make sure that they come here um we haven't uh you know talked about dates or anything like that but our goal is during the transition for them to be here and make sure that they offer the same services as cca good thank you very much that, that's and great. one other thing i think is yeah. important for us to remember they they pay twice a month they make two deposits per month to our account so it makes it much easier for us to trend analyze how we're doing financially the concern we have currently is, uh, Pam, I'm not going to misspeak, and I say that you and I talked about this today, 
and they have still not rectified April and May. And we're right. almost to the end of June. They just and closed my out. concern is, oh, sorry, ma'am, go. They just closed out March, so. Right. So my concern is we don't know. I mean, really, the coronavirus hit the end of March. Where are we financially? You know, we're making cuts, trying to do what we can, but we don't know the numbers are accurate. And that's what's probably the most concerning thing to me right now and why I think why I think Barbara didn't want to read I can't explain it but I'm sure that this processing is a big component yeah uh, Mr. Karen just to add quickly uh, Rita's much larger in CCA there's a particularly in uh, Summit County most of Summit County political subdivisions are with Rita other than uh, Barbara and Norton and a couple others so I, I think they are you, you can go and look at their member list they uh, are very large have enough well over 100, if I'm looking at this correctly, communities in Ohio. And the difference between the Council of Governments structure and the uh, CCA structure, CCA is just the city of Cleveland's. They provide a central collection agency uh, format. The COG does the same thing, read a COG, but we actually become members of the COG and help with the management. So does that summarize it, Robert? Yes, I mean, just think about our dispatch, regional yeah. dispatch. It's a call. Yep. Right. This is the same thing, but it just does income tax collections. Right. And we'll just meet at the table. We'll Any further discussion or questions? I do have a presentation that was sent to Mr. Fowler and myself today um, from Rita talking about their services. Would you like, like me to forward that on to you? That would be, yeah, why don't we do that? That would be good. And they're willing to come to a council meeting as well. Okay, good. Very good. Um, anything further? So there's a motion and a second to um, add Ordinance 66 2020 to the next agenda for its first reading. We're looking at suspending second and third so that we can get notice to PCA. Um, is there any further discussion? Would the clerk call the roll, please? Ms. Ripke? Yes. Mr. Kernan? Yes. Moving back up to letter F, ordinance number 64-2020, Wolf Creek Conservancy, Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think everybody's familiar with this. Uh, I would have preferred that everyone see the uh, presentation that I gave at the uh, community center. Uh, it it uh, described in detail all of the problems with flooding that we have in the area. <clears throat> and it, it uh, uh, shows uh, pictures of it. It shows where they are. It shows the, uh, uh, the reason why this needs to be created to generate a steady funding source to, to uh, uh, dredge when necessary cut trees and brush out of the uh, creek, creeks. I said creek, creeks. There are 12 altogether. Um, um, I've walked a half a dozen of them extensively and, and I can absolutely verify that the pictures are lenient. They are not even uh, they're not even uh, close to the actual problems that are involved in these creeks. And all of those creeks eventually end up in Wolf Creek, which uh, eventually ends up at the Tusk, of course. And right before it enters the Tusk, you've got Hudson Run coming in with a great rush of water for flooding downstream also. Uh, I've been talking to some of the farmers in the area that have uh, quite a bit of problem. I had a fella call me from Popley just the other day that is not even in, you know, he lives in the city, I mean, in the township of Copley, not Norton, but he called me because he knew I was involved in this Wolf Creek thing. And he wanted to know when we were going to do something about it and if we were going to do something about it. And I said, I really don't know because it hasn't been uh, really brought before council to discuss it lately, uh, I did tell him that our council, Copley and uh, Barberton's council did pass this for a uh, Wolf Creek watershed about, I believe it was four or five years ago, uh, passed 
I believe with uh, unanimous votes from all three districts. And it's been said by, uh, I believe by some of our council people that they would rather not uh, us do it as a council on our own, which we have the legal authority to do so because they felt that it was the uh, taking the authority away from the people who live in the other townships and the other cities. But the two major, most major cities that would be involved in to any extent at all are Copley, Norton, and Barberton. And at one time, they have already passed this. So in my opinion, they were in favor of it at that time, whether we would want to take two or three years to get them all together again, like we did the last time. Um, I don't believe that's uh, doable. I, I don't believe it's something that we should undertake, wait another two or three years to do something about the flooding that's been, it's been uh, going on for over 50 years. I've got, uh, I've got it uh, on, on a thumb drive that anybody was actually interested in looking at, they could see uh, numerous places in these creeks that were 80 feet wide in the 30s. And today, some of them are only 20 some feet wide due to the, uh, er uh, the uh, sediment buildup and the, the trees and brush that have grown into the creeks to block the flowing of the water. Uh, as I've said before, there's uh, man-made objects that are being put in the creek that's causing problems that hopefully we're taking care of now through the Corps of Engineers. But, but there needs to be, in my opinion, uh, there needs to be a, a, uh, uh, a source of income and it should not just be generated by Norton, Barberton, or Copley because that's not where the water comes from. The water comes from uh, uh, all the townships north of here that do not run north into Yellow Creek. Now, I could name them, but it takes time. So uh, those, those uh, townships and cities that would be involved in a minor way, just portions of them, um, are as responsible, if not major responsibilities coming from them, the water is, um, such as Montrose area, most of not Montrose, not all of it, but most of Montrose flows south <clears throat> uh, and crosses the, the um, divide. And some of it goes north to the Yellow Creek Reservoir, I mean, Re Yellow Creek watershed, but most of it comes to uh, through Copley and into us, and of course, on into Barberton. And since all of these communities are, <clears throat> excuse me, generating a water that's coming south over us and flooding us, I don't see a problem at all with them paying or helping to pay, not paying, but helping to pay uh, all the communities that are south of them to stop the major flooding. The major flooding, major, not all of it, but major is, is Norton and Barberton and Copley. Uh, there, is, there are uh, numerous communities without naming them north of that and northwest of that mainly that contribute a great deal of water most of the water actually uh, except for the Montrose area and that contributes a lot um, that that should be uh, I don't I don't see why they would object to stopping the flooding that some of it is coming from their area if you're flooding your neighbor why shouldn't you help correct the flooding problem? And I believe they, hopefully in my mind, they, they would be cooperative. Uh, the, the, assessment rec uh, the assessment estimates from everything I can read from all the past uh, hydrological studies and things that we've had done throughout the years, um, anywhere from 40, I think, up to $75 a year per parcel. And that's not necessarily, uh, uh, that might even be less than that if it's, if it's set up in such a way where uh, unpermeable surfaces would pay a little more maybe even. But the, the farmers and the average homeowner that has property that he mows these grass and everything, uh, where he has a, a surface that collects water and doesn't let it run off as bad as some of the concrete areas 
Uh, there's two or three different ways of setting up the assessment. But first of all, it needs to get to the judge again, the Summit County judge. We have the authority to send it to him or her, him or her. Then they would contact the Medina County because portions of it's in Medina. They would get together and, and if they agreed to set up the watershed conservancy, then they in turn would appoint that three member directorate that would have two years then to set up a plan and present it to the judges, the two judges. They would present this plan um, that they took maybe as long as two years to, to set up and it would not be implemented unless the judges okayed it. So really you have five people after we submit it and they approve it, you have five people who would look it over and see if the plan that these three people came up with over the two year period would be a plan that would that would uh, do what we're trying to do to stop the flooding. Would, would it include uh, reservoirs, uh, retention slash detention ponds? Would it include dredging? Uh, um, all, all the things that are necessary on all of these streams and the major streams are Pigeon, Wolf Creek, uh, and Hudson Run, of course. Uh, so there's all kinds of things. All of the above probably would have to be done. And, and I would hope that the judges in their wisdom would, one of those three people I would hope would be a, uh, an engineer or something in that nature, a hydrological engineer or something that would know what he's talking about to help the other two. So I, I propose to um, ask the council to uh, pass this on to our next agenda and approve it. Uh, but that's entirely up to the rest of council. We've waited, as far as I'm concerned, we've waited 50 or 60 years, actually, more than that, really since there was, has been any uh, amount of work that you could call work done on these uh, creeks. And I think it's, it's way past time to step up and do what's necessary to at least try to stop the flooding. We've been talking about it for years, but nobody has really done anything about it. Um, I, I, I don't have anything else to say about it. I, I'd like to pass it on to the next agenda and take a vote on it. Thank you. Anybody else speak up? Yeah, um, Jack, you know, I'm, I'm for having this district. Mm -hmm. I'm just uncomfortable with the method to get there. I would much rather have those other municipalities buy into it and you say it's time consuming and you're right it is it's very painful and time consuming but I'm just concerned if we take our stand at this right now that especially in these perceived difficult economic times that for us to engage in a tax that would affect other municipalities and other residents we're going to have quite a few battles on our hands and it's going to take longer to get it through in the long run than if we went through the city governments and got some general consensus agreements. I, I mean, I, if for no other reason, I would second this so that the total council would get to weigh in on this. But yeah, I'd like to hear from a few others. Do we need a second this to discuss no. it? No, we don't need a second to discuss it. I mean, my problem is the same as I said before. Um, there's, you know, everything Jack, you said about the flooding is absolutely true. There's no doubt that there is a flooding problem. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. The problem I guess I have at this point um, is turning this process over to a judge and three people who are appointed by that judge that we have no control over. We, we don't appoint those people. We can't, if they make this decision and put this in place, we don't have any input as to how much they decide to charge. Um, I mean, this is kind of like a tax without representation. Well, let me interrupt you just a minute, Joe. I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. You don't want to turn over the power of the purse 
to three people or, or two judges and three other people. If even if we got each and every single municipality or township involved that has a creek running through it that eventually makes its way to Wolf Creek, if you got each and every single one of them to say, yes, we want to present this to the judge, who do you think would run that that Wolf Creek watershed then? It would still be two judges and three triumphant, a triumphant of three. Well, it I know that's that's we my problem. Uh, you could get by. Any, you, we wouldn't have any more authority then than we do the way we're talking about. And that's not what I'm saying. I don't care. You get everybody on board with it. And I got a problem with turning it over and telling people that we're going to let three people who you did not elect, who you did not vote for, decide that they're going to tax you and how they're going to use the money. Now, if we want to do something different and set up a, I don't know what the options are, whether we can do this as a number of communities and impose and, and each community impose a tax and put that money in a pot and, and work on, I don't know if that's possible, but I, it has nothing to do with the number of communities that would need to be involved or are involved. What it has to do with is people who aren't elected telling me I have to pay this much money based upon the value of my house. And by the way, we're not going to let you decide how to spend it. We're going to decide how to spend it and where to spend it. Well, we could go back and forth. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to argue with you or anybody else about it any more than it's absolutely necessary to make my point. Uh, we, our engineers aren't elected. We hire an engineer. Uh, Mr. Fowler's not elected, and he makes major decisions that affects our city. He's not elected, and he's overseen by us but as council. Uh, uh, the Anybody you want to talk about that works for a city or a county government that's not elected, all of, all of their people are appointed other than our county engineer. Um, so you can, you know, you could have a, a thousand people working on this project and none of them actually, unless that judge saw fit to say, uh, Mr. Zeta, as mayor of Norton, we'd like to have you on that triumphant, which I would hope, in my humble opinion, that that's what I would do if I was the judge I would appoint a hydrological engineer that knew exactly what he's doing. Then I would appoint, like you said, some people who were elected from those areas, such as Mayor Zeta or, or uh, uh, Copley uh, City Administrator, whoever they, their township, whatever you call them, there are, or the mayor of Barberton, somebody who is elected to sort of keep them in line when they start talking about Let's do this, let's do that. Uh, uh, truthfully, some of the people who are elected, uh, I would rather have an expert. I, I can name, I'm, I won't, but I could name a lot of things and a lot of people that's made decisions concerning this flood problem throughout the past uh, 20 years that I've been following it, 25, that have made decisions to do certain things in their communities that did nothing to help the, the uh, flooding problem. All it did was, well, it didn't help anything. The, the decisions that the elected people made didn't help anything. But we have seven people here. And surely to God, between the seven people, uh, uh, we've got enough brains between the seven of us to say something needs to be done. And if, if the city of Norton had a, if the, I'm just for an example, if the city of Norton had a hundred million dollars to spend on flooding, can anybody on council tell me what we could do within the city limits of Norton with a hundred million dollars that would help anybody with flooding other than Norton and Barberton? I, we could build a great big dam or something and catch all the water and it would solve the problem with with uh, Norton and Barberton, or at least slow it down, but it wouldn't do anything for Copley. It wouldn't do anything for uh, Granger Township or Sharon or Wadsworth Township or the city of Wadsworth, Bath. It wouldn't do anything for them. Their water's still flowing in our direction. And all we're doing is catching the water and saving our flooding problem with our $100 million, which we don't have. And, and you can, 
you know, Joe, you were here. You know how long it took to get our council, our council, just ours, to vote to pass this the last time it was passed. So if the people who are, the people who are saying that, that, you know, we should do it, get all the communities together, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that if, if I thought it could happen while I'm still alive. But it really would not happen. I, I'll be 76 years old this coming year. And, and it, I mean, 75 years old. And it is impossibility that you're ever going to get a consensus from all these communities over the next five to 10 years. And in the meantime, we keep flooding. We, I'm, I feel that we are presently in danger of losing some of our major employers if we don't do something about the flooding. I mean, people on Barber Road are building their buildings now to accommodate the flooding. We're not building or creating help with the flooding for them. They're actually building their buildings high enough to keep it out of the water. That's ridiculous. This should have been done um, 25 years ago. This should have been done. There should be reservoirs, dams, uh, I mean, uh, recreation areas around these retention and detention ponds that children could play on a playground or they could go swimming in. There, there's absolutely no reason why these, these ponds and stuff that would necessarily be built could not be an asset to the community. Uh, I, I just can't understand. I, I don't know. I, I'm in favor of passing it. Anybody that's not, then fine. You know, bring it to a vote is all I'm saying. Bring it to a vote. And if everybody's against it, it'll be Jack Gaynor standing here saying, I pass it. And everybody else can say no. That's fine. But then I'll shut up about it and never open my mouth again for the year and a half that I have left on this term of office. Because if the council won't do it, I can't do anything about it. And I've spent a lot of time and, and effort trying to just trying to make a uh, presentation that that uh, only generated 30 people. So there's only 30 people that was interested in the community enough to even come and see the presentation. So I, I just think it's uh, something that should be done, uh, has to be done. And, and uh, we'll, we won't know what those three people will do or the two judges until we do it. That's the problem. There's no way to get around it though. That's You're never problem. ever gonna have a system that that you can say I have all the authority and I know where that money is going to go. But the problem is we don't have any authority over this board. That's the problem. None. Well, I ask? Well, actually, like I said, Joe, if if one person on that board was to be someone like Marzada, who who is elected, or or someone like uh, uh, Dan Corrant, who is elected. But there's no Ron way that we can see that. Could you could know, I? add something. Yeah, go ahead. The uh, MAD district, when it was being formed, um, I was being consulted a lot during that time period. And as I saw that form, which you were there, and you, you and Scott, I think Dennis also saw that in the formation. Um, the, the key was they did go to the judge. They did get it approved. It did go forward. But built into that was just Norton and Barberton as a mosquito abatement uh, um, uh, district. And so built into that also was how the board was going to be constructed. And that was an appointed member of Norton, appointed member of Barbara and, and some others that were designated and it was written right into that mad district. Now the watershed districts are a little bit different but I'm wondering if there is a method to build in for specifics. And then after those districts were, were that district was created, others took an interest and then signed on or were at least interested and were considering signing into the MAD district. And, and so I'm wondering if that might be uh, a way to get it started and then add them as they choose because they see the results. And again, I don't think this is the way to do it, 
Uh, Jack, if you want this to come to a vote, I will second it and I'll probably vote against it. That's fine. Uh, also, uh, you might want to think about the fact that we south of us, we have the Muskingum watershed. And when it started, there was X number of dollars as an assessment. And that watershed was so adequately and, and uh, expertly ran that now there are no assessments in the Muskingum watershed. It's 100% assessment free uh, due to proper management by the people who run it. And, and why, why would we think that if one person or not only one, I, I forget how many watersheds are around the state. And I've heard nobody say that they're, they're running amok, the people who run them. Uh, uh, from everything I've read or heard, especially about Muskingum, they have been absolutely excellently ran. They have uh, did such such uh, so so great of a financial responsibility that they've actually making money for the watershed through their water and oil and gas rights, and there's no question in my mind that we also have those rights. I mean, with all the water that is generated here, and there may not be an oil boom like there is in the Muskingum Valley or area. But there's a lot of things that can be done that, that those assessments that we would have to assess on these uh, parcels, there's a lot of things that could be done that, that would not only benefit the flooding problem, but it would benefit uh, uh, a better life for the citizens. It would have uh, extra lakes that they could go to and fish. There's no reason why they can't be stocked with bass and bluegill and everything else. These lakes are, are not just a little pond. That they, some of them are going to be enormous. And, and they, they, the lakes themselves would take up areas that are swamps today. They, they would be an improvement to the area. I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't understand the, the hesitancy. But as Paul, or as uh, Dan said, He's seconding and, and said he'll vote against it. So more power to you. That's all I got to say. If there's no other question, I would just ask a call for a question. There's a motion and a second to add uh, ordinance number 64, 2020 to the agenda, next agenda for first reading. Anything further? Clerk, call the roll, please. Mr. Gaynor? Yes. Mr. Karen? No. Mr. McLeod. No. All right, then that will not be added. Um, so uh, that should be it. Um, our next meeting then will be June 22nd. It'll be a regular council meeting. It will again be by Zoom and uh, YouTube. Um, is there anything further to come before council? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned. Joe, please give me a call. I will. Thank you.